Well, now, the first thing one notices about Isaiah is that it's very long uh, and it's sometimes difficult to find your way through. You don't know where you are and uh, there doesn't seem to be much shape or structure to the book. Um, Isaiah himself, the prophet, occurs in a few narratives, uh, particularly in chapter 7, which is the famous Emmanuel prophecy, and then in chapter 20, where he walks around naked for three years in Jerusalem, and then in chapters 36 to 39, where he takes part in various incidents when the Assyrian king Sennacherib came up against uh, Jerusalem and Isaiah was advising the king Hezekiah. So those are three narratives that Isaiah occurs in. And also in the first part of the book, in chapters 6 and 8, so either side of that chapter 7, he speaks in the first person. Of course, the famous um, vision where I saw the Lord high and lifted up and, and, and all that, uh, and some related matter there. So the character of Isaiah, the historical prophet, uh, crops up in those places. And one would naturally assume that some of the chapters around about there are also going to relate to the similar sort of time frame. We're talking here about the last decades of the 700s BC, uh, when Judah, with its capital in Jerusalem, where Isaiah evidently lived, was a relatively small and insignificant country, but the great Assyrian Empire was on the rise and... and, and uh, so the Judeans had to be careful how they were going to react to this, to this superpower that was, was coming. So that's really um, the first half of the book. Now there's other material there that I'll say something about in a moment, but roughly speaking, we seem to have their sayings uh, by the prophet relating to that situation, uh, often castigating the people for their lack of social justice or their pride or their idolatry or whatever it might be. Um, and, and giving advice, uh, sometimes very positive and, and promising them that the better times could come, other times saying judgment will fall because of the sin. That's fine. And then when we get to chapter 40, there seems to be a complete change of mood. That's the chapter that begins with the famous bit from Handel's Messiah, you know, comfort, comfort ye my people, says your God. And we move into a series of chapters that are very, very lyrical poetry, lots of talk about salvation, light to the Gentiles, ways through the desert and so on. Many of the most loved parts of the book really come in those chapters. And the situation clearly relates to a much later time in history. Uh, there's a, a Persian king, Cyrus, who's mentioned by name at the end of chapter 44 and again at the beginning of chapter 45. Now Cyrus, we know, was the Persian king. The, roughly the story is that eventually, long after Isaiah's day, uh, Judah and Jerusalem were defeated by the Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar and so on, and a number of the people were taken into exile in Babylon, and Cyrus and his successors allowed many of them to return the kind of material we read about elsewhere in the Old Testament in Ezra and Nehemiah. And it looks as though those central chapters of the book of Isaiah, whenever they were written, by whoever they were written, relate to that period of time where the message is very much one of salvation, uh, of God as the universal God for the whole world, nations coming to his light, and so on. And that's the second large section of the book. And then, starting at chapter 56, the last 11 chapters, we seem to be back in Jerusalem. Initially, with great hopes, arise, shine, your light has come, the same kind of language that you get in the middle part of the book, but also in the surrounding chapters, a sense of, well, God, you promised that all these things were going to happen, but they don't seem to be happening. Why not? And reasons are given, ah, yes, because you haven't done this or that. If only you do this, then your light will come and shine. So scholars for a long time have recognised that this very long book breaks into roughly three parts that seem to relate to different periods of the history of Israel, Judah, the Jewish people. Uh, the times of Isaiah himself, uh, about 150 years before the end of, uh, of the kingdom of Judah, uh, very often with rather dark, negative prophecies, then relating to the end of the period of the exile in Babylon, this very joyful, lyrical salvation passage, and then uh, at the end um, almost saying, yeah, but the promises haven't quite worked out like that. Maybe, you know, we need to do some adjustments. Now that's fine. That gives us an overall shape. But having said that, 
we notice that in the first part of the book, chapters 1 to 39, there are bits here and there that sound much more like what comes at the, uh, towards the end. And it's not quite as neat and tidy uh, as we might at first suppose. I mean, there have been scholars who said, you know, you've got three separate prophets here and they were just all stuck together on a scroll. But as we read them, we in fact find that they intermesh much more. Now, I do take the view that these books or these parts of the book were written at different periods of time, but actually when we come to interpreting the book, that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is to recognise which situations are being addressed by the, by the prophecies um, and who wrote them perhaps is slightly secondary. But I do work with the overall majority of scholars who think that they were written uh, by different people roughly at the times they relate to. But I find it very interesting that, for instance, in the first part of the book, we have bits that sound like the later ones, and it looks to me as though the people who wrote the later parts have actually taken the earlier prophecies of Isaiah and deliberately bound them together to make one book. So that, for instance, if you take chapter 1, the introductory chapter, the first uh, uh, nine verses or so sound very like the situation that uh, Isaiah was referring to um, when Jerusalem was blockaded by the Assyrians. That seems to fit there well, and he's obviously telling them off pretty much. Then the second part of the chapter starts by saying you've been faithless, but then comes on to much more promises, though your sins be like uh, scarlet, they may become white as wool, and so on, and, and the, the promise of the possibility of forgiveness and, and, and reconciliation. And then the last part of the first chapter sounds, especially towards the end, very like what happens right at the end of the book. And so it's almost as though chapter one has been assembled to introduce the three parts of the book and to give us a way of reading. Now, it's not just summarising them. Uh, there's lots of other important material. The messianic theme, to take only one, uh, very important material, which is not referred to in chapter one. But what I think chapter one is saying to us is, look, as you read through this book, through the times of judgment, through the time of salvation, through the time of adjustment, read it as serious and as it calls for some sort of response. And chapter one invites the reader to make a positive response in order that the uh, salvation, the deliverance, the blessing may come, rather than uh, ignoring it, in which case it'll all end up being burned up like fire, which of course is how actually the very last verse of the book as a whole also ends up. So chapter one, as it were, gives us a bit of a, a, a summary like that. Okay, so that gives us something of an overall shape for the book. And the question I think that then arises is, okay, let's take it seriously whenever it was written, by whoever it was written, let's take seriously that it's addressing rather different uh, historical situations. How does this affect the way that we're going to interpret the different parts? Because there's a sense in which uh, reading the book like this gives it a, a, a bit of, of depth and vitality. Uh, and we don't just read it all on a level. And so we find that some of the major themes that uh, run through the book actually develop or move or change shape as we go on. And my own view is that, that that can then be helpful as we try and apply it in our own day because we live in very different times and circumstances. Maybe we can begin to see uh, patterns or lines that, uh, of interpretation which we can take forward uh, in, in, into New Testament times or indeed into the 21st century. Uh, so, uh, to give one example, a, a major theme in the first part of the book has to do with what we would call social justice. Um, there's a kind of catchphrase, justice and righteousness, in a traditional um, uh, translation. It comes about 11 times in the first half of the book. And Isaiah often has to criticise his audience because they don't practise justice and righteousness. And if you look at what that means, it means uh, the courts, the, 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 the civil courts are being misled by people who aren't giving people their just deserts in the court. Maybe two people come with a dispute over a land boundary or property or ownership or something like that, uh, and the court is favouring the one with the bribe, the more wealthy or whatever. Those kind of themes. And so we have uh, Isaiah naturally being uh, very critical of, uh, of the fact that 
people in positions of privilege and responsibility who ought to be using that privilege for the benefit of the less well-off, in fact, are using it to, to feather their own nest, if I can put it like that. Okay, fine. What happens then when you come to the second part of the book? Now, you see, in the first part of the book, we're dealing with a country, with a king, its own courts and everything else. In the second part of the book, we're dealing with the descendants of those people who have no independence. They're part of the great Persian Empire by now. They, they're not independent. They don't have their own king. The, the Persian king is there. How does that get applied? And in one of the very famous uh, parts of the uh, second half of the book about the servant, three times it says he's going to bring forth justice to the nations. Scholars have got themselves tied up in knots. What does that mean? Uh, as far as I understand it, it means exactly what it means in the first part, but it's being applied differently now. It's not just being applied within the society of little Judah, but it's being applied on an international scene, justice to the nations, it says several times. I'm talking about chapter 42, first four verses, behold my servant whom I uphold, and so on. Okay, fine. So this servant character who is depicted in some way using royal king-like language seems to be a sort of king, but his authority isn't just over Judah, but it's now on an international scale. My own view, judging from the context in the previous verses, is that this is a way of depicting Israel in its ideal state. As Israel is going to be restored with the return from the exile and so on, so she will act as, as a way whereby God can mediate his justice on a worldwide scale. And then in the third part of the book, we find it's brought down to a, a much more mundane level where people are exploiting workers and so on in chapter 58. Uh, and so this theme of justice and righteousness uh, moves through different political settings and applies it in each case in a way that one can see to be appropriate to that setting. Uh, another example, just to give you one more. Uh, when Isaiah had his great vision of God, I saw the Lord, you remember, high and lifted up. That's a key phrase uh, in the book of Isaiah. The idea that God is high and lifted up. I'm afraid there's a sense in which Isaiah is not very politically correct by the way that we think of it today. He does seem to have a hierarchical understanding of society. The king is on top, then there come the officials, then the, the people are there. And of course God is, if you like, right on top of the pile, high and lifted up. And so in Isaiah's understanding, anything, any human person or institution that tries to make itself high and lifted up is automatically doomed to failure because that pride setting oneself up as being, if you like, on a level with God. And so you take chapter 2, where it says that the Lord has a day against everything that's high and lifted up. And he goes through a whole list of things, um, trees, mountains, fortresses, all kinds of different uh, elements that seem almost to be trying to imitate God. Uh, and God has a day against them. God is unique. He has his way of ordering society through, through the king and so on, <coughs> uh, to whom respect is due. Uh, and, and anyone who tries to usurp that position is doomed to failure. Fine. Now, let's, go, let's jump right over into the third part of the book. Uh, 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 another passage which is uh, very much loved of people, where it says, Thus says the high and lifted up one, the high and lofty one, who inhabits eternity. Of course, God but who also condescends to people of low estate. So as we travel through the story of the book, we find that this God who starts out as being so exalted and one might say unattainable, through the story of a judgment, but then of salvation and restoration, is the God who in his position of supreme authority exercises that authority for those who are lowly, meek, weak, and so on. One other interesting observation on that phrase from the middle part of the book. We all know and love Isaiah 53. 
about the servant who was, suffers and so on, led like a sheep to the slaughter and so on. Do you remember how that passage begins? Where, presumably, God speaking says, Behold my servant, he will be high and lifted up. It uses exactly the same phrase to say that this servant who we're going to read about is going to be in degradation, suffering, apparently killed unjustly and so on, but is going to be restored. <laughs> he is going to be high and lifted up. In other words, the, the character who gets into the lowest point is going to be exalted up to the divine level. So that's uh, a, a, another theme, if you like, that runs through the book. Now, look, I can't, in, in, in the space, I, we, we don't have five hours for, the, for, for, this, for this session. I can't go through every theme in the book. But what it seems to me we have to try and do when we're reading a passage in Isaiah is to look out for, it might be a word, a phrase, a notion, which resonates elsewhere. Take the theme of glory, for instance. I've actually just had a, 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 a woman from Singapore come and do a master's thesis with me. Very interesting on the theme of the glory in the book of Isaiah. It comes right there in chapter 6 again. Um, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts and God, uh, Isaiah seeing his glory. Uh, it comes in chapter 40, all flesh will, be, will see his glory. Uh, and it comes in many other places. And when looking at a passage in which it occurs in one context, it's worth having a look at the others and seeing whether, again, a sort of story develops about how that applies in different circumstances. Um, and, and, and so one could go on. There's another one about um, raising a standard to the nations. Sometimes God does that in order to summon them for judgment, like at the end of chapter 5. Other times he raises a standard to bring the nations in order to restore Israel. And you, you, and you, can, you can build a story up out of that. 